Hey everyone, and welcome to Victory Church Online. Today, our founding pastor, Pastor Mike Ware, spoke about how to overcome discouragement. Check it out. Amen. Won't you be seated? We're so glad to have you. I'm Pastor Mike Ware, the founding pastor. And I'm speaking this morning because your pastor, Pastor Jonathan, is lazy and didn't want to preach. I'm just, no, I'm just kidding you. Pastor Jonathan, one of the best preachers, pastors, human beings that I've ever been around in my whole life. He and Kristen are amazing, amazing people. You need to thank God that you have a leadership team like we have here. Pastor Matt over in the Longmont campus. By the way, welcome to all of you that are watching online. And if you are in Longmont, why don't you find us there at our Longmont campus. And I'm telling you, they're tearing it up over there and God is doing some amazing things. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Amen? amen. I said amen. amen. Well, uh, I haven't talked about Boudreaux in a long time. So I figured, by the way, how many of you have ever been to Louisiana? Didn't you just regret it? <laughs> Humidity, bugs, mosquitoes. I'm telling you, it's, it's like a foreign country. I'm just telling you right now, I was raised there. And uh, they've got weird people called Cajuns. And they have odd French names like Arsenault and Boudreaux and Thibodeau and Ardwine and all these different kind of French names. And of course, you know, I grew up with all those French, Frenchy people is what they are. And they speak Cajun. Well, anyway, Boudreaux and Thibodeau, uh, they are amazing people. And, uh, but I heard about uh, Boudreaux and his wife Clotilde and their little boy T-Boy. Uh, Clotilde had heard that they built about a five or six story shopping mall in New Orleans. And like every kind of woman, whether you live on the bayou or you live in a subdivision, women want to go shopping. And all the men said, oh me. And so she begged Boudreaux, said, Boudreaux, take me to New Orleans. I want to go shopping. So they left Bro Bridge, got on Interstate 10. They drove all the way down to New Orleans, this big mall. I mean, that's... I mean, they never hardly get to town. I mean, they're always in Brobridge or right there on the bayou. So, I mean, this is pretty amazing. Well, Clotilde instantly goes off shopping, and Boudreaux and T-Boy are fascinated by an elevator. They've never seen an elevator before. And, I mean, the door opens up, and people get on. The door opens up, people get off. And he's watching that. T-Boy's just watching. I mean, it's like entertainment for them. And Boudreaux and them, they saw this older lady get uh, on that elevator, kind of shuffled in there and got on that elevator, I mean, those doors closed, she disappeared. A moment or two later, the doors opened up, and a beautiful woman walked out. <laughs> Boudreaux said to T-Boy, go get your mama. <laughs> That's bad, isn't it? That's Louisiana humor right there. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go retro for a minute. Is that all right? I'm the founding pastor. I can kind of do what I want to do. I'm the, I'm the head gyrastacutus, as they say. <laughs> you know, we founded our church on making a declaration. And uh, I want to go back and make our declaration. I just decided from now on, I'm preaching here at the church. I'm just going to bring back my Bible. And by the way, you ought to bring your Bible to church. Does anybody have, does people still have Bibles? Okay. Do you actually open them, open them up? Good deal. I know you have digital Bibles. That's all good. I'm good. I bring my phone. I've got my Bible on there. If you don't have that, then load it on there. It's free. But make sure you have your Bible. So here's what I want you to do. Hold up your Bible or your digital Bible in the air. Let's make our declaration. Everybody says, this is my Bible. It's God's Word and promise to me. I am what it says I am. I can have what it says I can have. And I can do what it says I can do. I'm a believer, full of faith and power. I'm an ambassador. I am a conqueror. I rule over the devil. Therefore, therefore, every day, every day, I will say, no devil, and yes, God. Come on, give our Lord a good shout this morning. Woo, amen. Man, I feel so refreshed just by doing that right there. Amen. Amen. You know, uh, Moses had died, and Joshua took over. 
And uh, he began to lead God's people into the promised land. And God said something to Joshua that was amazing. He said something to Joshua that he needed to hear. In fact, I think you need to hear this very same thing this morning. In Joshua 1, let me read this to you in verse 5. It said, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. And I will not leave you nor forsake you. He said, be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide an inheritance, the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous, he said. I want you to see what he's saying. He's saying, Joshua... I want you to be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. I want to speak to you this morning about being strong and being courageous. Because, you know, sometimes we're not very strong. We're not very courageous. And the reason why is because we have so much discouragement in our life. And if you want to be strong and courageous, you've got to overcome discouragement. Can I hear an amen from anybody? You know, life is comprised of ups and downs and good and bad and evil and and all these kind of things. Life is not always fun, is it? I mean, we have good days, bad days. And look, when there's good days, there's peace, there's joy, there's hope, there's all those kind of things. Am I right? Because when you have good days, that's how you feel. When there's bad days or hard days, I'm going to tell you, you feel the weight of the world coming upon you. You feel like there's despair on you. I mean, you feel like there's depression. You get discouraged and disappointed. And I believe there are some people that are just like that right now that are in this building. You walk through those doors this morning, and you feel the weight of the world. You feel like it's not going to get any better. And you're tired, and you're weary, and you feel like there's darkness that has surrounded you, and you feel discouraged. Well, I want you to know this morning, I want to help you to get over your discouragement. One amen. Amen. Now there's eight. (laughs) I want to help you to overcome discouragement. Who needs to do that today? Amen. I'm talking to the right people. How do you overcome discouragement? Three different times God spoke to Joshua. He said, be strong and courageous. Be strong and And be courageous, very courageous. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. You know, when I realize that God is with me, can I just tell you, when I feel like God is really with me, I can whoop the devil with a switch. He said, Joshua, I want you to understand something. He said, you need to be strong and of a good courage. Don't you let discouragement pull you down. Because I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm not going to leave you. You're not separated from me. Uh, I'm in you and you are in me. And we're going to go together in this life. Look, there's not a human being today that's sucking air that has not fought hours or even days or months of discouragement. Am I right about this? Because you get surrounded by dark days and there seems to be no light. So you pray, you hide, you cry. And nothing ever seems to change. I think I'm talking to somebody right now. Somebody needs to hear this message. Because you just dragged yourself in here this morning. You got your happy face on. You got your Christian face on. And I'm glad you came. But we need to recognize that we can overcome discouragement. You know what the word discouragement means? It means to be depressed be down. But the original language is the word dispirit, dispirit. It's like you've lost your spirit. You've lost your enthusiasm. You've lost your passion. And yeah, you've come, come, you came into the house, you're singing words, but there's no passion with it. There's no enthusiasm with it. It's because you're surrounded and covered by darkness. You feel such darkness on you and, and such discouragement right now. It's that dark cloud that's hanging over you. By the way, discouragement has a voice. And it says to you, you can't make it. You're no good. There's no need to even try anymore. You might as well just give up. 
Why did you even come to church today? Nothing is ever going to change. Discouragement always has a voice. If you're going to win over discouragement, you're going to have to fight. You're going to fight the good fight. You're going to have to endure. You're going to have to trust God. And you know what? I'm looking at you right now, and I'm just going to say right now, you can do it. I said you can do it. You can do it. You've done it before. You can do it again. God told Joshua, he said, be strong and of good courage. And then he said, be strong and very courageous. That means to grab hold of courage. That means to seize it. Draw it to yourself. He said, I'm with you. Don't be afraid. Everywhere you go, I'm going to be with you like I was with Moses. Why did God tell him that? Because he needed to know that wherever he went, God was going to be there. Whoever he faced, God was going to be there. Whatever fight he had, God was going to be there. I want you to know this morning, you're not alone. You're not alone. You know, I, I know right now in my spirit, man, you're sitting around people, but you feel like you're the only one here, that nobody cares. Nobody knows what you're going through. It's not part of my message right now. You just feel like, why am I singled out? Why, why am I going through all of this? You know, God's trying to tell you something. He's trying to tell you, it's going to be all right. Amen. It's going to be okay. You're not by yourself. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. But sometimes we have a discouraging moment. Let me tell you a story of when I was five years old. That was 66 years ago. Now, if you're a public school graduate, let me tell you how old I am then. <laughs> I'm 71. There we go. <laughs> Look, I, I'm, I'm so old, my dad used to draw pictures on cave walls. <laughs> the Dead Sea wasn't even sick. <laughs> I got a compliment the other day on my alligator shoes, and I wasn't even wearing any. <laughs> Some of you just looked at your feet and you said, I got some too. <laughs> but when I was growing up, we never had candy or Cokes. I was five years old, and I had one of those moments, a discouraging moment, five years old. Changed my life. And uh, we had dessert pretty often. You know, in Louisiana down south, you have dessert after every meal. How many of you like dessert after every meal? I'm just saying that's the will of God. I already know that. <laughs> but we didn't have candy. We didn't have Cokes. We didn't have money for all that kind of stuff. We, were, we weren't, just didn't have it, you know. But I really enjoyed it when my mother would go to see her friend, whose name was Martha. We'd go to her house. I was five years old. I wasn't even in school. They hadn't invented kindergarten yet, and that's true. They had not yet. And so I, was, I would go to her house, and in my eyes, I thought they were very wealthy because they had a big house. They had carpeting. We didn't have carpeting in my house. We just had two bedrooms and one bath, and that's my brother and I and my family lived there. And, um, and so they had a big house. They had a yard keeper. They had a maid by the name of Rosie. And, um, but she always had candy in a dish on the coffee table in the living room. And I remember that that dish was made out of heavy cut crystal glass. Anybody ever have those? You've seen them? They're, they're about this big and they feel like they weigh five pounds. Cut glass, they're heavy. Got the lid on it and everything. And she always had those, those pink and pale green mints, dinner mints in there. How many of you enjoyed those when you're, some of you still like them, I do too. And then sometimes when I'd go over, she would have those white mints with those green chewy stuff on the inside. Come on, anybody old enough to remember that? Amen. You got the alligator shoes too. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, look, I mean, it didn't matter to me whether the the green mints and the pink ones are the other kind. I mean, it was great for a sweet tooth deficient five-year-old because uh, I wasn't in school yet, but it didn't mean I wasn't smart. <laughs> Mike, there's the door right over there. <laughs> Even you had to laugh. I, I was smart. 
I feel like Forrest Gump right now. <laughs> stupid is as stupid does. I know what love is, Jeannie. <laughs> but uh, as soon as we'd get to her house, they would start talking in the kitchen. And I would just kind of casually wander off, and I would just always find myself in the living room by that coffee table where that cut glass dish was where all the mints and candy were. And I would lift that little heavy lid off and I'd put my little hand in there and I'd put that lid, and I had to be real quiet because, you know, that crystal kind of rings. So, and, and, but I, they couldn't see me. They were in the kitchen. And I'd put that thing back down there. and I, would, I mean, I did that over and over and over, but I was smart. See, I was really smart. I knew not to eat all of them. So I always left a little in there so they wouldn't think that I ate them all. But one day we went to visit, and in my haste, I snuck off into the living room, and there was that beautiful cut glass dish with the lid on top, and I went over there and grabbed that thing, and I reached my hand in there, and that glass, crystal glass lid slipped out of my hand, fell on top of the tile floor that was in that living room, and I mean shattered into a thousand pieces with a loud noise that sounded like a sonic boom had just gone off. And for a moment, time stood still. <laughs> and when I saw that glass shatter in a thousand directions, I saw that candy just floating off, saying goodbye. <laughs> and I had two thoughts in my mind as a five-year-old. Number one, I'm dead. <laughs> Number two, I'll never get to eat candy again. <laughs> and at that moment... Despair came upon me. I mean, suddenly everything got dark. A cloud of darkness surrounded me. A spirit of discouragement grabbed hold of me, and it felt like the end. I'm speaking this morning on overcoming discouragement. And if anyone was overcome by discouragement at that moment, it was me, a little five-year-old boy. And I knew that I was going to get the living daylights beat out of me. Because, you know, back in the day, that's when they actually whipped children. <laughs> Instead of just put them in time out to let them think about how to get away with it the next time. <laughs> Isn't that right? And how long do you leave a child in, in time out before they really get it? Is it until you get over your anger? Have you thought about it? Is five minutes enough? Ten minutes enough? Thirty minutes enough? I mean, I, I learned a lot about life because my mother had a red leather belt that was about three inches wide. Me and that belt got to know each other pretty well. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I was so overcome by discouragement. You know what I wanted to do? I wanted to go run and look in a mirror because I knew I would never look this good again. <laughs> I'm telling you, discouragement leaped upon me. And I knew I was going to die. I knew it was over. And that was going to be the end of the candy. I was so discouraged. Can that candy had a voice. It started speaking to me in foreign languages. It said goodbye. Sayonara. Hasta luego. Ciao. And I started speaking to the candy all by myself. I said, so long. Farewell. Avisa saying Goodbye. To you and, and you and you and you and you. The spirit of discouragement didn't wait for me to give it permission. It came on me. It's like it does you. And I was instantly depressed. I'd done something wrong. And there was no way I could cover it up or explain it. All I know is that after that loud noise, my mother and Martha ran out of that kitchen down into that living room. And my mother called out using my full name, Michael Arthur Ware. <laughs> it's the name. I mean, really? I, I'll tell you, anytime anybody uses my middle name, it creeps me out. It reminds me of when I was five years old. 
I mean, have you ever figured out why you have a middle name? Nobody ever uses them. I remember one time in a phone book, I looked in a phone book to see if anybody had a middle name. You'd see initials, but no middle name. I mean, it's like Jimmy Smith. It wasn't Jimmy Goober Smith. <laughs> Hi, I'm Goober. I'm Jimmy Goober Smith. They didn't put that in there, just Jimmy Smith. I'm trying to forget my middle name, but oh, there are just some people that won't do it, like your mother and your wife. And all the men, don't say a thing, men. I'm, don't do it. Don't say anything right now. So there I am, little old me, adorable, cute, sweet, lovable, irresistible, such a darling, just like now. And suddenly... My innocence was violated and my virgin ears were corrupted. <laughs> when I heard those words from my mother, Michael Arthur Ware, what in the world are you doing? Well, I, I put on the most pathetic look that I could put on and I said, I better start crying. <laughs> if I close my eyes, then I won't know what hit me. <laughs> so I started crying and suddenly I heard the soothing words of Martha. Her friend. She came to rescue me. She said, Mike, it's all right, honey. Mike, it's all right, honey. I'm just glad you're okay. And then she turned to my mother and she said, I have plenty of dishes for candy. I didn't get beaten. <laughs> I didn't get whipped. I didn't get scolded. I didn't get reprimanded. None of those things. I only have one thing to say from that moment in time. One word. Mercy. 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 It was mercy on that very moment that set me free from depression. And I'll never forget that moment knowing that when I was suddenly filled and overcome with despair and depression and discouragement, that someone showed me mercy. And immediately that dark cloud that was on me was lifted and I was free. What I'm trying to tell you today is this. Yes, you may be guilty. Yes, you may have done something wrong. Yes, you may have a cloud of darkness around you. Yes, you may have gotten caught. Yes, you may have dropped the lid of the candy dish. But there's mercy that God has come to give to you today. Mercy that will set you free from depression, from darkness, from despair. I'm talking about mercy that you can't get on your own. That just comes from that soothing voice of God. Mercy to rescue you. You know, God's spoken to me before. He said, you know, I've got plenty of dishes in heaven. Because he loves me, he loves you, he cares about you. You matter to God. And he's here to show you mercy. You know why? He wants that cloud of darkness to come off of you right now. Mercy. Mercy. Let me read this to you. I was thinking of David, the king of Israel. He cried out to the Lord. He said, Psalm 42 says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, and I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Another translation says it this way. It says, But O my soul, don't be discouraged. Don't be upset. Expect God to act. For I know that I will again have plenty of reasons to praise him for all that he will do. He is my help. He is my God. David was so depressed and so discouraged that he called out to God. And You know what he found? It's what you're going to find too when you call out to God and lean on him and put your hope in him. You're going to find mercy. Come on, everybody say mercy. mercy. That's what's in this house right now is mercy. For you that have been surrounded by darkness, mercy. And if you'll put your hope in God, that cloud is going to lift. That heaviness is going to go this morning. And you're going to leave this place with a whole new joy. Look, your situation may not change, but you're going to feel hope again. 
joy again. I think somebody here is going to receive it. You're going to receive it. I'm here to tell you that if you'll just put your hope in God and trust Him, you're going to find something this world can never give you. You're going to get free. You're going to get free. I want to share three things real quickly. That's my introduction. <laughs> you don't mind giving me a few extra minutes since we had child dedication? Is that all right? Okay. I want to show you how to get free. Anybody want to know? It's what I do. These are life lessons. I just teach you what I do. I learned it at five. I learned something about mercy, and grace, and love, and compassion. And I realized my God was the same way. He's the same with you. That's why he told Joshua, he said, he said be strong and of good courage. He said, as I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you. Let me give you these three things. Number one, you need to guard your words. If you want to overcome discouragement, guard your words. I mean, let me look, look at this Bible example. You know, the Israelites, I mean, they were free from Egypt. They were headed to the promised land. And, 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 and I mean, it took a while to get there. I mean, they just didn't get there overnight. But I want you to see something. In verse, Numbers 21, verse 4, it says, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged because of the way. Sounds like people that I'm looking at right now. You become very discouraged because of the way. And watch this. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. I want you to notice that the journey got hard. It got tough. It was longer than what they thought. And they became discouraged because of the way. You know, this journey of life is not easy. It's hard and it's difficult. And we run into all kinds of obstacles and enemies and trials and tribulations. And because of the way, we get discouraged. And then we begin to speak out of discouragement. Don't look so innocent out there. I know you're doing it. Because when you're down, you don't see the when you're down, you don't see the way things are, you see the way you are. Did you hear that? You see every I mean you're down and gloomy and dark, and that's how you see the rest of the world, because that's the way you are. When you're discouraged, you can you can get into more trouble because you speak against things. Your words come out of your mouth because you're discouraged, and you stay discouraged because of your words. Next thing you know, when you do that, those words come back like they did. And I mean, the protection of God came off of them because of their words, because of the way they got discouraged. And their words, they spoke against God and Moses, and God removed his protection. Next thing you know, they're getting bit by the things of this world. I want you to get this. There is grave danger when you are discouraged. Because you'll open your mouth and you'll curse your life and your journey and your destiny. It says because they were discouraged, they spoke against God. You know, when you're discouraged, you just need to keep that little hole that's underneath your nose shut. You know, the Bible says that Jesus was oppressed but opened not his mouth. He knew. He knew. I'm talking to somebody right now. Most never realize word curses. We don't even hear that term anymore. Word curses you have with word curses. Because the things we speak in our life are about our life because of discouragement. You know, we get discouraged and it's really easy to open your mouth and say words like, well, I guess it's not going to get any better than this. We say things like, well, you know, the Bible's not working for me. You know, I went to, I went to victory for three weeks and nothing happened. I did what they asked me to do. I prayed for five minutes and here I am, same as I was. I, I even tried tithing once or twice, and that God didn't open any windows of heaven to me. I never got a car. All I got was a bill. You better be careful what you say when you're discouraged. 
Because those word might, words might be curses that you speak over yourself and over your life. Look, when they spoke those words because of the way, they got discouraged. As I said a moment ago, God pulled back his protection and allowed those words just to come to pass. It's kind of, you know, people sometimes come to me and say, Pastor, I'm always sick. I'm always sick. Well, the reason why you're always sick is you always say, I'm always sick. You've cursed yourself with your own words. I never have money. Well, the reason why you never have money is because you keep saying, I never have money. If you, how many of you want money? Okay, don't be so, don't, don't be shy. We all want money. I want some too. I've told you before, I've had a little, I've had a lot. I like a lot. Okay, if you want money, go open up a bank account and trust God to fill it up. It's called faith. Instead of saying, I'll never have money. I'll never have money. I'm always going to be broke. Well, you're always going to be broke because you've been speaking word. Are you following me? You're speaking word curses over your life. No wonder you're discouraged all the time. The Bible speaks of the tremendous power of words. God, God, the creation that, that, that we see and we're part of came because of the words of God. His words have ultimate power and authority. And Christians don't always understand uh, the spiritual dynamics unleashed when we, with our tongue, use words to speak about things that go on in our life. I mean, when we throw our words out into the atmosphere, something happens. And most Christians never grab it. They never get it. And they wonder why they're so discouraged all the time. I'm telling you how I get encouraged, how I stay strong and of good courage. I'm telling you what I do. I watch my words. Your words can bless you or curse you. The Bible says life and death are in the power of the tongue. It says in Proverbs 12, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. You ever heard the old saying, sticks and stones shall break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's a lie. Because your words that you use can hurt you. It can be a curse that destroys your life. Are you following me? James 3 says this. He said, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. And with it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men. And we have been made in the similitude of God. And out of the same mouth, watch this, out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursing. My brethren, these ought not be so. Now, he's not talking about profanity here. But words that bring a curse. Because words have power. It's creative. In Isaiah 57, it says, I create, God says, I create the fruit of your lips. Some of you have been eating from the fruit of your lips. You're discouraged and you're down and you're troubled and you're all those kind of things. Let me just give you a a few examples. You'll say, uh, and I've already shared some of these. I'll never get any better. I'm always sick. Uh, 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 Everything I do fails. Who would want to marry me? You know, I'm not good. I mean, I never will be. I'm always sick. I'll never get better. I never have money. Word curses. You need to guard your words. Because some of you are cursing your life with your words. No wonder you're discouraged all the time. No wonder you're down. Look, the, look, the devil will take your words and use them against you. But if you'll give God something to work with, he'll bless you. If you've been living under the curse from the power of your words that came from discouragement, change your words. I said change your words. Let me give you number two. God is always with you. God is always with you. The very first thing that God told Joshua after Moses died, he said, as I was with Moses, I'll be with you. He needed to hear it. You need to hear that right now. And I don't care what you're going through or how dark the day is. God is with you. Everybody say, God is with me. He's with you right now. He's going to be with you when you walk out. He's going to be with you when you go eat. He's going to be with you when you go to sleep. He's going to be with you everywhere you go. And I tell you, it's so hard for me to get discouraged when I know that God is with me. There are many times there's, there's no person there for me. When I'm carrying a burden or have a weight, there's not anybody there for me. They don't know. They don't know what I'm going through. <laughs> but I serve a God that has mercy. 
loves me is helping me to have courage and to be strong. He reminds me, I'm with you. I haven't left you. I haven't forsaken you. If you're having trouble believing that God is with you, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you hear what I said? Most people don't talk about the Holy Spirit anymore. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. A third of the Godhead will live in you. He will guide you, direct you, lead you, all those kind of things. We need the Spirit of God in our life. I mean, how, look, how can I fail? How can I, how can I be overcome when I know I can throw my shoulders back? i got a third of the Godhead living in me. Watch out, devil. I'm on my way. Get out of my way. Dark day, I'm about to shine some light on you. All right, I'm, real quickly, I'm just going to tell you what I do in my prayer, a little part of my prayer life. I'll just reveal a little something about this. I, almost every day I pray through the 23rd Psalm as part of my prayer journey. You know, everybody knows the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Well, I, I kind of talk to God. I said, Lord, you're my shepherd. Every, you guide me, you lead me, you're my shepherd, you, you direct me in the way. I mean, and I know the voice of the shepherd. The shepherd knows my voice. And if I go astray, I know you're going to leave everybody and come get me because you love me. You're my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not want. You're going to meet every need. It didn't say, I shall not need. He said, I shall not want. And I got the revelation a long time ago that God, he wants to meet not just my need, but all my wants. You know what that does? That just so encourages me that my God loves me. He's going to watch out over me. He's going to provide for me. He makes me to lie down beside green pastures and still waters. It's talking about peace. You know, when you have peace and you can sleep at night, discouragement will never get a hold of you, ever, ever, ever. And I just remind myself that God allows me to lay down by that stream and by that green grass. He restores my soul. And, he, and he, he leads me in paths of righteousness. No matter what I do, if I call out to him, he'll redeem me. He'll forgive me. He'll restore me because that's the kind of God. I don't have to be discouraged because I messed up. See, some of you are living under condemnation, but you need to understand that once he forgives you, that sin is as far as the east is from the west. You're free. There's mercy right there. Don't let the devil condemn you. Don't let him discourage you. You need to remember that he's the God that restores your soul. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you're with me. You're with me. And I just remind myself that I'm not an orphan. I'm not abandoned. I'm not left alone no matter what I go through in this life. He's with me. Through the dark days, hard days, death-looking days, God is with me, with me, with me. Discouragement comes to many because because they feel like God has left them. He hadn't left you. He prepares a table for me in the presence of his enemy. I think about this all the time. I'm sitting at a table, and I'm surrounded by my enemies. They've got to watch me eat what God just fixed for me. You know, that's, that's like rubbing the dog's nose in it. That's exactly what that's like. And I just sit there, and I just bask in the glory of God. How can you be discouraged when you're eating at the big table? I mean, God has donuts there. Steak, baked potatoes. Come on, anybody here in the house? He said, my rod and staff comforts you. It means he's going to protect and defend me. How can I be discouraged when I know that I've got a big God who's watching over all of my life? And then he says, he will anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. And I think about the God who's so gracious to heal me. Whatever physically, mentally, financially, emotionally that I go through, he's my healer. He's my healer. He's my healer. Mercy. The last thing, and I'll just be real quick because I'm way past what I wanted to go. You need to encourage yourself in the Lord. That's the third point. You need to encourage yourself in the Lord. If you remember the story of David and Ziklag, 1 Samuel 30. He and his men went off to war. They came back and they found the city of Ziklag ransacked. All their children, wives, all their possessions taken. It was so bad, you just couldn't believe it. I want to read this to you, 1 Samuel 30. And David was greatly distressed, discouraged. For the people, these were his own men, were speaking of stoning him. Because of the soul of the people were grieved. It was a dark day. Some of you had those kind of days. Everybody was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. 
But David, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Nobody came to David. Nobody helped David. Nobody spoke words of life to David. He himself had to encourage himself in the Lord. He had to seize and grab the right words that would make a difference to his life. And he made himself have courage. And if you know the rest of the story, he said, shall I pursue them? And God said, pursue. They go after him. They destroy that enemy. They recover every single thing, every child, every son, every daughter, every possession, all their wives. And they had a great victory. And they overcame that discouragement. You can overcome the discouragement in your life and see a victory in your life if you'll just encourage yourself. I may not be able to be there right when you are discouraged to help you get encouraged. There may not be be anybody around you that can say those words. You just sometimes have to pull yourself up by your bootstrap and say, hold it right there. I'm not going to think this way anymore. I'm not going to say this anymore. My God is with me. He has not left me. I'm under his mercy. I'm under his power. I'm under his direction. And I'm not going to live being overcome by discouragement ever again. I want to pray for somebody right now. I saw some hands earlier saying, I I believe this message is for me. If you walk through those doors a little while ago and you feel like this weight is upon you and this darkness is upon you, I'm not going to say it's going to lift off. I'm not going to say that that darkness or, or the situation you're in is going to change, but I will say this, that darkness or that dark cloud is going to come off of you And you're going to feel hope again and rest again and find peace again. Oh, you'll have to go deal with that problem later on. I understand that. But you're going to feel like you got joy, that you're going to have expectation. You're going to feel like you can win. You're going to feel like you're the victor. You're going to see the mercy of God in your life. Because you've overcome discouragement. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you this morning, the people that lifted their hands. There are some right here that need to guard their words. Lord, they've been speaking word curses over their life. They've been saying things, Lord God, that's produced a life and a lifestyle. And they feel like they can never get out of the problem. Well, it's their words or their problem. Because of the way, because of the way, because the way has been hard and dark and difficult. And they just start complaining and griping and all these things. And Lord, no wonder their life is a mess. Today we're changing our word. If that's you, I want you to stop it. I said stop it. Won't you change those words right now? Plant a different crop. Lord, there are some in this house right now uh, that they not only need to guard their words, but they need to realize that you have never left them. You have never forsaken them, that you are with them right now. Everywhere they go, Lord, when they face that problem, when they walk out of this building, you're right there with them. As they have to deal with some situation, you're right there with them. That should give them hope. Lord, I'm praying that they'll encourage themselves in you. Because you're a mighty God who loves us and cares for us in the name of Jesus. Come on, if you receive that, would you say amen this morning? Amen. Amen. One last thing. Look, look, let's just get real right now. You're in church. You came here. You wanted to... Why you came, I don't know. I mean, maybe you just feel like you're part of the family, and I'm glad. Or maybe you're new. I don't know. But it's time to quit playing Christian. Did you hear what I'm saying? It's time to quit playing like you're a Christian. It's time to become one. And some of you have been so far from God, you've slipped so far away, and you know it. And you come to church so you'll feel better about yourself, but you walk out and you still feel the same. The reason why is because you've never given your whole life over to Christ. If you'll do that today, as I've been talking about the dark cloud and the condemnation, those it's going to lift right off of you. You're going to sense something totally different. You're going to be skipping out of this building rejoicing but you're the one who has to make the decision and I want to give you that chance right now bow your heads for just one more second you need to give your life over to Christ I'm talking about all of it you've held on to part of it and it's a mess your life is a mess because of that but today you need to give your life to him you need to give your heart and soul to him just slip your hand up and say pastor I know you're talking to me I've been under discouragement and condemnation I want to get free right now I want to get free I want to get free. I see three hands already. There's another one. Is there anybody else? There's another one and another one and another one. Come on, anybody else you want to get free right now? You want to give your life? There's another one and another one and another one. Come on, somebody. God is in the house. There's another one. 
Father, I thank you for the people, these wonderful people, Lord God, who are crying out to you. I'm tired of playing Christian. I'm going to become one. I ask you to come into my heart. If that's you and you lifted your hand, you just pray along with me. Lord, I invite you into my heart. I invite you into my, 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 my soul. I want you to change my life. I'm tired of living for myself. I want to live for you. I know it's a journey. I know I'll make mistakes, but I'm going to ask you to let the blood of Jesus cover me and wash me and cleanse me and make me a new person today in the name of Jesus. And for this, I give you thanks in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. If you're in the house, why don't you shout to God right now? Amen. This is such a great reminder to be careful the words that we're using, to be sure that we are filling our lives with the word and being present in God's presence so that he can fill us with courage. He can encourage us throughout our day and bring true life, true joy, even in those trials. And maybe today you've decided, hey, you know what? I can't have this type of encouragement. I just feel so discouraged all the time because I don't have God in my life. I don't even know where to begin or how to do that. Today is the day to say, God, I surrender. I give it all to you. I don't want to be faced with discouragement day in and day out. I want to be able to take things on head on. And when I do face those trials, I know that you're by my side to get me through. So just go ahead and surrender yourself to the Lord ask for him to come into your heart, come into your life to make you new today. And today you are a new creation in Christ. We love you. We want to support you with some various resources. So reach out to us, send us a message on Facebook, Instagram, email, whatever it is so that we can get behind you. We hope to see you again Sunday at 10 a.m. in person or right back here at Victory Church Online. Have a great week.